but we're here to talk about beauty and mobilization. Uh, so we're going to kick right off with the first question, which is it possible to make beauty discoveries in a world that is so mobilized? And Nikki, I think we'll start with you. Absolutely. I mean, part of my role at Space NK is constantly traveling the globe to find out how other cultures interact with beauty, what is important, what resonates in different countries, and then disseminate that, bring it back to UK and US where we have our stores, and give our customers something to learn and grow with, because who says that we have the best methodology around skincare, hair care, fine fragrance, you name it. I think it's always traveling with your eyes wide open to see what we can learn from other cultures, seeing what resonates with other populations. I mean, it's interesting. If you, Japan is somewhere that I've always been very influenced by. If you look at that perfect porcelain skin, immaculate texture, and the attention to the littlest details there. I mean, the whole culture of relaxing in hot springs for me is wonderful on the basis that the bathtub has been my point of refuge ever since I was a kid. And I think you can see the products in store that have a little reflection on that. Rob, what do you think? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> is it possible to make beauty discoveries in a world that was immobilized? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think, as Nikki says, I think there is a thing where one tends to sort of be be trapped in your very kind of Western European, Northern Hemisphere, American mindset. Uh, and there is a lot going on uh, elsewhere. And it's going on not just in a, but I think the thing is, it's not going on just in terms of a sort of natural ingredients thing. I think with developing economies, what you tend to find is that there's much more interest in ingredients. So take Brazil, for example, which is a sort of coming economy, that the amount of time and effort that is being put into the natural resources and plants coming out of the Amazon and being refined and being properly scientifically tested and developed is amazing. And all that sort of stuff is very new. Um, so yeah, there is. There's a lot happening. I think it's also, sorry, I'm butting in here, but it's also interesting <laughs> when you think of the whole Brazilian body beautiful totally. and the obsession about beauty is not just from the shoulders upwards, it's the entire body and different attitudes towards that. Yeah. Yes, I think one of the things I first remember going to Brazil is seeing every single person has amazing hair. It's just like this glossy, bouncy hair. And so I know with us, with our um, mascaras, for instance, we were like, oh my God, what are they doing to get that hair? And it's that keratin that comes out of Brazil yeah. and yeah. carnauba wax and all these amazing ingredients that yeah. you spoke of that we were like, we have to put those into our mascaras. Gee, can you imagine a, uh, a Brazilian beauty brand? Why isn't there one? There is Natura, for example. Yeah, but Natura is kind it's of like cheap a body, body shop, shop. Though, isn't it? I mean, like, why isn't there a, why isn't there one here that's like a premium hair care that's range? Because I Brazil. haven't spent enough time Get over Brazil. there. <laughs> there you go, license you, to go traveling you know, again. You know, I think because this is one of the things, though, that the so all of those developing areas that the brands there are so few brands from them that fit into a sort of premium space, you know? Yeah. I mean, there are very, they very have few. A it's still way dominated. They selling, though, as well, don't they? Because yeah. in Brazil, they, they like to sell person to person. So I think the issue there is they don't sell so much in stores. They have, like you mentioned, Natura, and um, even Avon and Botticcari, they all started off selling person to person, like neighbors to neighbors and word of mouth. That's just a bit naff, though, isn't it? it is, but it's <laughs> such a huge market, Sorry. though, now. So I think now that's changing. <laughs> Fora has gone in there. Yeah, no, I'm sure has, Space yeah. NK will be yeah. sure to follow because they love, they're absolutely obsessed with beauty. It's about to be like the yeah. second largest market yeah. in the so world. So no run Tupperware parties coming up anytime no. soon? <laughs> No. <laughs> Not at all. No, because the reason for it, I think, is because there isn't the retail infrastructure to do yeah. it. You know, I mean, that's the, the thing is there isn't a Sephora or a Space NK. They've got Sephora there. now. But there's like two, isn't there? You yeah, know, I, mean, I it, guess it, because it, they, they let it, us All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> Um, just actually, when we talked about this, each of you mentioned travel as being really important. And when we were talking before we came on stage, we were talking about anecdotes and things that have inspired you with your brands. And I'm just wondering if there's one moment in time or one travel experience that, that's really 
something you'd like to share with everyone that, that's either built up your brand or made a, a great change in how you've operated or with products or just one thing that's been kind of a monumental moment with travel for you? Anybody who wants to kick off with that one. I won't tell you. I won't tell you that one, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you a second one, which which is uh, it's it's a rose thing, right? Which is that until um, so I don't know if you know our Moroccan rose range, but until that sort of point, really, rose to me was very kind of Thatch Cottage and Liz Hurley and Bronley and Penhaligons and very English and innocent and sort of pale pink well, and everything. Day. Yeah, and kind of old ladyish. And so the whole idea that Rose actually isn't that, that it's something that's much more exotic and sensual and sort of younger and all the rest of it, was very much a sort of just a reframing of the whole idea. And I think that's one of the things that travel gives you. It's not just a discovery of something new. It's a reframing of the things that you already know. And that, I think, just made me think about it in a totally different way. Right. Nina? Um, yes, well, again, talking about Japan earlier, I remember with, our, um, with Aiko, when we first started, we had a sort of manga character as part of the look. And when we first went to Japan about 15 years ago, we were like, oh, they're going to love this. I'm sure everything, everything in Japan is just covered in cartoon characters. And then there was nothing was like that at all. And we put um, Japanese writing on our products, and, and we were saying to people, what does it say? And I said, it doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh gosh, and it was such an eye-opener. And even now, we just made a recent trip out there, how you sort of think that the Japanese are influenced by Western culture, but they're not at all. They don't read English, they don't really speak English. They're very kind of, they like products that are made in Japan right. and very specific. So that, was, that to me was like, oh, it's so different. So now, recently, we, were, we have this amazing eyeliner that's one of our best sellers. And it's like a, a sponge tip nib, so it's really easy to I use. I know it, I love it. Yes, <laughs> Ico Skinny Liquid Eyeliner. And we've got um, Alexa Chung has just joined um, Ico, and she's always banging on about this. This is the perfect pen to create the perfect cat eye. And we went to Japan, Sorry. and they were like, nobody uses that here. And we were like, no. what? And they all love a brush tip because they're in school, whereas we're sort of used to using pens, they do so much calligraphy that they're so accustomed to using like a fine brush to do their eyes. So all the um, pens there are with brush tips. So that's just sort of learning things like that all the time and just sort of not having those perceptions of what you think, oh, the Japanese like that or the Brazilians are just about the body beautiful. When you actually go there, it's a completely different scenario to what you imagine. Right, right. Okay. I think for me, travel was absolutely pivotal in terms of coming up with the whole Space NK concept because as children, we used to spend three months of the year, basically when school was out in the Valencian region of Spain where we had a second home and grew up with that fabulous Spanish pharmacy culture, the perfumerias and so forth, where particularly in perfumerias, you'd have people who were truly passionate about everything that they carried. Very often they'd be independent rather than part of a chain. And there was a story be behind every product, every fragrance. And from the age of probably six onwards, I used to collect the deluxe sample bottles. My mother used to think, oh, she had to indulge her fragrance purchasing to make sure the lady was okay with me hanging out in store <laughs> to such a level. But it was also, I think, really, from teenage years onwards where you saw how people interacted differently. In the UK, you had either the department stores or the high street chemists as a place to buy your beauty. But department stores were about the monobrown counter, very often with the overly made up dolly bird behind it, trying to convince you that she offered her top to toe answers to your every need. Or you had the high street chemist, which had fantastic products within, but little ability to test, or if you were looking for specialist advice, didn't really exist in any way, shape, or form. I mean, how many of us in this room actually have bought a product, particularly when it comes to makeup, looking at that little plastic chip on the gondola, thinking this has got to be the perfect color. Yeah. You get it home and it bears no relation to that. <laughs> Not you. Okay, Rob, we know that you'd be different. <laughs> but to my mind, there was a much better way of doing it. Imagine if you went into the local pharmacia 
explained what your problem was, the lady would run around pulling products from different brands, presenting them to you as the solution, and by and large, it worked. That expanded my horizons in terms of the approach to beauty and how retail in could be different. Right, right. Now, Nina, you touched briefly on technique. Yes. And, um, I think this is something I'd, I'd like to speak a little bit more about, and we'll kick off with you. Okay. And the question of, do you think that there are still natural beauty techniques to be discovered around the world with travel or things like social media and the way the world is opening up and sharing so much? Do you think there's still discoveries to be made? Oh, definitely. I think. The thing about social media is, and um, that's sort of making everything more global, is that we all get to sort of discover these little niche brands and gems that we might not have been aware of before. And certainly in terms of technique and, and new products, I know like about 10 years ago, we sort of moved all our production from Italy to Asia just because we'd been on trips there. And just seeing now at that time, we've had like conditioning ingredients in our mascaras forever. To me, it's like standard because it's such a standard thing over there. Why wouldn't you? Right. And yet now that's becoming a thing here. So I think, I mean, there's just so much to learn. And, it, and just then having sort of blogs like Nikki's and, and yours just really shares that with everybody. So we all get a chance to go and discover for ourselves. Right. Tap. Sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> Just actually, uh, with skincare as well, is, are there new techniques to be found in, in how you apply product? Or uh, yeah, there are. I, I think. Look, to be honest, the the thing about skincare really is that there isn't a mythical country with incredibly beautiful people that have this amazing beauty secret that right. nobody's discovered yet. Oh, they haven't let you in yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, they haven't let me in yet. But no, there isn't really that particularly. I think, uh, you know, it, it, there is, uh, certainly in Europe, I mean, the, the thing about the, because how it works really, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I will, but whatever. <laughs> Is that it sort of doesn't work like that. I mean, really, the thing that happens is in terms of ingredients for skincare, really, there's a middle sector of loads of companies that are cosmetic ingredients and active manufacturers. And they scour the globe looking for stuff, and they do, and they isolate it and find it. So you'll find in northern France, for example, there's a company that specializes in everything to do with, with uh, stuff from the sea. Right, so they'll do every type of seaweed, they'll do everything you can do with salt water, they use all of that sort of stuff. It, and that happens everywhere, really. So the advances are really from these companies, you know, finding ingredients. So it's really much more of a scientific discovery than it is me wandering around with my goat herd outfit. <laughs> going to a country and going, wow, why is your hair like that? That's so amazing. <laughs> Sit down and tell me about it over your local tea. That sort of, that sort of doesn't, that's sort of not how it is. I, 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 there are ingredients, obviously, that I think are, I think it's like I said about the rose thing, I think there are lots of ingredients that are to be rediscovered in a way. So even something like shea butter, which is an amazing thing, and if you wander around the market in Ghana, it is there in the market, and it's raw, and it's red, and fresh, and it's amazing. And that hasn't really been kind of properly done, I don't think. It's sort of been done in some ways, but it hasn't been done as a proper brand. And there are those sort of things, but really, it's much more of a sort of scientific thing than an anthropological thing, if you right. know what I mean. I think you've got the scientific piece when it comes to product development, but certainly from a ritualistic and application point of view and techniques, there's a lot we can learn from different countries. I mean, if you look at, as you mentioned earlier, the keratin blow dry and so yeah. forth, which really came from Brazil, fine. Then the, West, the rest of the world worked out how to create the same effect, but without the formaldehyde exactly. and chemicals within that. That's where it becomes yeah. super interesting of what you can learn from other cultures, totally. other fashions, <laughs> a, and whatever, and then adapt it to absolutely. the local market. Absolutely. I mean, who wouldn't love to have kind of the Koreans where that you've got skincare ri rituals which could have 10 or 12 steps yeah. within yeah. that? Fine, I'm well, not you saying. You as a retailer, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, from a product perspective, that <laughs> wouldn't be too bad either. <laughs> no, but I mean, realistic no, no. is then how do you no, adapt absolutely. that to? No, a different totally, lifestyle. Totally, totally. So it is always eyes wide open. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And it's not just other countries, it's looking at specialists around the globe, whether it's the session stylist in outer Mongolia, not that it's no, going to be so developed there, but there are things we can learn yeah. from all over. I guess that sort of nicely segues into the next question. Is there a new beauty frontier? Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's, uh, but my view is that it's more a scientific one, really. I mean, I, I think the whole area of things like stem cells and nanotechnology and how all of that is progressing and vitamins and understanding all of that. I've read today, vitamin C was only, well, discovered is the wrong word, but only in about 1908 or something. Isn't that extraordinary? That something that you think is so kind of there is so sort of recent. But, so I think there is really the frontier for me really is very much, I mean obviously it starts with a, with a sort of natural ingredient or, a, or like salicylin and aspirin which comes from willow bark. It does stuff but the science to sort of make it better it seems to me that's really where the sort of game changers are going to lie in one sense. The other thing that's happening very much, I mean the, the strange thing in America is that um, you know, I look at anti-aging, anti-wrinkle creams in America, and obviously, for a lot of people, they're quite redundant because everybody has surgery. surgery. And, and really, so it becomes more a story about radiance and skin glow and all the rest of it, because wrinkles don't really exist for a lot of people, you know? And so I think the whole kind of idea of also what the other side of it is, what surgery does and how that advances and how that changes and all the rest of it also influences, you know, everything else, really. Sure. Shall I get my coat? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies? I think for, um, in terms of eye makeup, it's looking at different ways of application, adapting sort of makeup to suit who you are today and where you are in the world. So very much just about making things more effortless, easy, putting more ingredients in so it is just one step, not like three steps to get the perfect look. Right, right. I think there's so much to learn out there from not just the product standpoint, but if you look at how the beauty industry has changed and you look at the evolution of gadgets that are coming from the professional arena being adapted to consumer usage on a daily basis, each country is specializing in different areas. You look at the growth of beauty from within, the nutritional supplementation and the exercise piece, again, global influences abound and it's disseminating what is relevant for your home market at each term. Okay. Why isn't there an Italian skincare brand, eh? Like, I'm sure there probably is, actually. But there isn't really. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it, though? I mean, it's, all, it's so French, but if you look at how Italy has killed France in fashion and food and everything over 30 years, but there isn't, I'm amazed that there isn't really a credible Italian either colour brand particularly, but then you have great manufacturing coming they out of Italy. All, they are yeah. the brilliant yeah. manufacturers. Absolutely, in terms of How can they not apply? That's a weird thing. No. That's true. Oh, sorry. Perhaps it's an easier there. route to market. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, really. I mean, because it's interesting. I mean, it was one of the things I was talking about. The, the other thing about travel, as you know better than I do, really, is that I always get a slap round the face when I go to America because the culture of beauty and everything is so much more intensely on all the time than it is here. You know, you can be scruffy and wander around and it's cool and it's fine and whatever, you know. In America... They're you're offering you money on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I did Jack. stop somebody. Uh, I stopped somebody and they run away from me because they think I'm going to ask them for money. San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but the thing the thing about their beauty culture is it's totally different. It's 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 much I mean you look at teeth for example, you know, yes. as a little signifier of it, is you've got to have perfectly white teeth all the time, it's gotta be lovely. There's no room for other stuff and that's the same you know. And I think their whole if you look at it, I think the and I think you were very much part of this really, is that until about nineteen kind of 80, 85, the culture of beauty was very French, which was all about a lifestyle and you took care of yourself and there was mythical kind of way of doing it and living. And then the Americans came along and it was much more kind of problem solution. So, you know, you have strivectin, you get rid of your wrinkles, you do it. It's much more kind of direct scientific problem solution. And, and it sort of sidelined the French version of it for quite a while. I think the French is coming back now. But the whole culture of how you are in it and how you talk about it is so different, isn't it? I mean, do you find well, I think, that when you go to you the know, States? In the States, 
grooming is up there of paramount importance. Yeah. People are judging each other firstly on appearance yeah. and then what follows afterwards. But uh, you can go to the other end of the spectrum and say where we started off in the UK where uh, it's not right to be seen to be taking care of yourself is Absolutely. very much the sloppy end of the equation. Somewhere in the middle is probably the optimum situation. And I think it's give and take from both situations. I mean, it's interesting because you look at the states now, it's not as much kind of straight to the sergeant to go under the knife. People are looking yeah. now how to avoid going into that scenario because they've realized Actually, it's a little scary when people are looking as though they've been just come through a wind tunnel somebody, on a regular you know basis. Somebody told me about a face. Do you know what they do in a facelift? Oh, do you know what they do? No, no. They actually take your face off. They separate it from all the muscles in your face and then move it up a bit and reattach it. Oh my God! <laughs> you know, I thought I didn't think it was like that. I thought it was just you know a little lift here. But I no, to move the they just kind of skin you and put it back. Sorry, <laughs> that's horrendous, isn't it? So yeah, of course, that is a this next question that is a big that. deal. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, besides the facelift, what would you say is your most intrepid beauty discovery over time? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm a big fan of a silk pillow. Really? Yeah, no, really, 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 really. I, honestly, a silk pillow is, is I look, everybody go out and buy one. I promise you, they are fabulous things. I know they've got a, kind of not a great image. Well, silk sheets don't, okay? But a pillow, you're going to be fine with, okay? As long as it's ivory, not black or dark blue or crimson. Right? But honestly, they are extraordinary because what happens is when you sleep, if you're anything like me, if you sleep on it, your face, it doesn't get stuck, right? And so <laughs> it means that you don't get any of that thing. You know, Jeffrey Archer has those sort of things. That's all because of, no, seriously, that is because of the way it is. So look, honestly, a silk pillow, it will <laughs> minimize your wrinkles, I can absolutely guarantee you, and it is an inordinate pleasure to sleep on. Totally didn't think we were going in that direction. <laughs> it's also really good for your hair as well. It's brilliant for your hair, it's so brilliant for, for everything. <laughs> honestly, John Lewis, they're about 40 quid, but God, they're worth it. Every penny, I totally agree with you. Uh, honestly. I thought you were going to get more with Ren. But that's not what you meant, though. <laughs> no, but we have silk pillow oh, tonight, really so we're good. Yeah. I was thinking of that question in a different way. Well, <laughs> that. So, I was going to say that it was definitely, talking about Italy earlier being the sort of main place for manufacturing colour and so many of the cosmetics that we know, I feel that for me an intrepid uh, beauty move was like moving our manufacturing from the scar from Italy 10 years ago to Korea. And it was like, everyone was like, what are you doing? But it really is just the innovation over there is insane. It's amazing. And I think it? now we see it, everyone here has a BB cream, a CC cream, which is like old news over there. So I think yeah. that and just sort of taking taking a risk to do something different, like from the packaging that we have, squeezy tubes, because I was so tired of like scraping around the bowel, trying to get that last bit of mascara out that's always dry. How did you up. solve that one? By using this seven layer polyethylene tin foil sandwich of a tube. So you squeeze it and it's keeping the formula fresh. And again, because that formula's got all the conditioning agents in, so you're squeezing every last drop out and then you can just scratch up the tube to nothing to throw wow. it away. I think it's very interesting to see in certain <laughs> territories the resurged interest in bathing. If you look at how Bathing in France has always been about taking the waters at the Thalasso Therapy Spa. Japan, it's the relaxation, de-stressing piece with the Japanese hot springs. You also get a little bit of that in Scandinavia as well. Turkey, hammams. Yeah. Yeah. All the Muslim hammams. Things. Absolutely. Amazing. But Austria. it's all of that seen how it's when you look at the Americans who have very much been a showering culture, starting even to look at the interest, renewed interest in aromatherapy. I think we in the UK take it for granted that everyone knows about aromatics and we've had this great history within both the UK self-developed and also the influences of Eastern Europe and France with the whole 
plant extracts and botanicals and essential oil blends, when you're seeing a renewed global interest in that, it becomes very exciting, whether it's for bathing as, and also bathing as a relaxation process, because I think people are regarding beauty as more of a lifestyle choice and how they interact with that is part of their whole way they live their lives. Right, right. And just having that me time as well, that seemed to have sort of got lost along the way. People are claiming that back. Completely. Oh, okay, um, well I guess unless there's anything else that we didn't touch on that you guys feel you need to share with the audience. Or any more self pillows or facelifts or anything like that. I had a good day. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.